All right, I'm just like so excited about this book of Galatians. It's an amazing book of the Bible. It so speaks about what we're facing today in our culture, in our church, and it's just amazing how the Bible does that. It really does. And incidentally, the original writing of this book was by the Apostle Paul, about 50 or uh, 45 to 60 A.D., and he wrote to a church in modern-day Turkey, and it was called the Church of Galatia. It was a bunch of churches. It wasn't just one church. And he was dealing with something in his day that was very uh, difficult. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was dealing with something called legalism in the church. And I just want to help you to understand, for those of you that are your first time here or have not been here in a while, I'm going to catch up to speed just a little bit what we're dealing with, okay? Uh, what happened was uh, the early church was Jewish because Jesus was Jewish. And so the first Christians were Jewish. And for, you understand, for millennia, they were following the, the certain way of doing things. They followed the Old Testament, and they followed the Old Testament rules and regulations, and, and they did all that thing. And to be a good Jew, you had to separate yourself from the Gentiles, have nothing to do with the Gentiles. And then all of a sudden, there's a big shift that takes place. Of course, the Old Testament talks about the whole world will be blessed through Abraham's seed. They forget to read that part. And all of a sudden, uh, the Christians that are non-Jewish, called Gentiles, yes, the dirty Gentiles, become Christians. And all of a sudden, they start growing faster than the Jewish church. And also, they start to supersede the Jewish church. And so, and wait a minute, who are these guys? You know, we've, we've been holding the fort down for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and who do these guys think they are? And they can do all this. And it became like, a, like you know, we're the high church, and those are the dirty Gentiles, you know, we let them in, but, you know, you're going to get the scraps. You're going to be in the low class. You're not even going to be in coach. We're going to have you in, in the baggage section of the plane. I mean, we, we'll let you go on a plane, but you can't even sit in coach with us. I mean, it was that bad. It was bad. And it really got to the point where the apostle Paul had to deal with it. And he, he preached about, uh, they were trying to save themselves by doing rules and regulations. They thought that's what made you right with God. And, and, and incidentally, it isn't about that. It's about God's grace. And I will say today, we have a big a tug of war going on in the church today, the modern church in, in particular, in America in particular. There's this whole thing about grace. Yeah, it's grace, you know. Do what you want, bro. It's grace. Remember we talked about that? Either legalism or this sloppy agape grace. And the Apostle Paul's dealing with this situation and, and so we're going to look at today, I'm just going to recap what we talked about the last uh, four weeks. The first week we talked about living in the tree of life and how we can either live in the knowledge of good and evil, where it's all about rules and regulations and not relationship, or the tree of life, where the rules and regulations are there to help be a catalyst for a greater relationship with God. And we, the second week we talked about how we swing back and forth between legalism and grace and the conflict between the two. The third week we spoke about living in grace, and the last week we spoke about how you guys are all sons of God, including the ladies. Now, I know some of the ladies are like, well, I don't like being called the son of God. Well, you know, the men have been called the bride of Christ, so it's kind of fair now, right? And, and so we've been talking about we're all sons, and what does it mean to be a son? It means all the inheritance is ours in Christ Jesus. That doesn't make a difference if you're a woman or a man or whatever. You are or different. If you're highly educated, uh, you're rich, you're poor, it doesn't make a difference that because of Christ Jesus, we are all part of the family. And so that's what we talked about last week. Today, I want to talk about something with you. It's this. Uh, um, this is what we're talking about. Winning our internal, winning our internal civil war. I don't know if you realize this, but I think how many of us understand that we have a battle going inside of us? You want to do the right thing, you don't do it. You know, it's just like me this past week. We went on vacation for a little bit, went away, and went to Ben and Jerry's and had some car, uh, salted caramel with the syrup and the whipped cream. And, goodness, I, it was so good, and I saw the broccoli, and I said, you know what? I want pizza, and I want ice cream. Praise the Lord. And, you know, I don't want any of that. And, you, know, you, you know you should eat healthy, but you don't. And you know, that's, that's kind of a silly example. However, in the, in the real life, isn't it that way sometimes? We know the things we're supposed to do, but we don't do it. I know I need to do this. You don't do it. And sometimes there's other issues that are even more threatening. Perhaps maybe there's an addiction. You're struggling with you want to stop drinking so much or stop um, partying or stop doing this or the other. You, want to, you know you shouldn't be doing that in business, and you know that's not really correct, but you kind of wiggle your way through. And Hey, listen, if I, do, if I do it the right way, I'll be out of business. So I got to do it this way. And so we make concessions for ourselves of how we're to live our lives. Because, you know, after all, God understands. You know, God's got a grace, and it's going to be okay, man. God got a grace, and he understands. I, and, hey, I'm just only human, God. You know, I, I'm not Jesus, so I'm going to make mistakes. And, you know, I just go to God. He's okay with it. Oof, some people are, are flying that thing, and that's not the way God would have us. 
And so today, I want to talk about the internal civil war that we have. Make no mistake, throughout history, the worst wars there ever is, is a civil war. The bloodiest, the most inhumane, the most suffering. Across history, you'll see it when there's a civil war. And that's why families hurt each other, don't they? Let's face it. And so inside, there's a civil war inside of us, isn't there? We don't want to do the right, we want to do the right thing, but we don't do it. And, and we all struggle with this. You know, we know uh, what it's like to have holy ambition, to help the poor and help people that are less fortunate, and it's our desire to do that. But you know, you know what? I'd rather buy that new, uh, I'd rather get that new uh, 4K television. Forget about helping the poor. I'm going to take that myself. Uh, or on the other hand, you, you struggle, you want to serve others, but you want to be served yourself. Or, uh, and this goes on and on and on. You want to accomplish great things for God, but it's easier to watch ESPN. Come on, let's, let's, let's just relax for a bit. There's an inward civil war that takes on, and the two things are diametrically opposed to each other, and it's frustrating at times. In fact, you, you're like, you know what? I'm tired of battling. Let's just give in. I'll put a white flag up. I'll, I'll do the best I can, but God's just going to have to get, cut me some slack and give me some grace. God, you, hey, I'm only for, uh, God. Hey, God, I'm only human, man, you know? Be easy on me. It's okay, God. You know, it's this grace, bro. And so we get this idea, and I think we're really in dangerous territory if we have that kind of attitude. So what does the Bible say about how do we find ourselves free of that? And I think you know what, you, I think you know what I'm talking about, because there's been times in your life and my life we've done the right thing, and it feels right, right? Like, whoa, this is totally God, not me. I mean, I'm doing the right thing. I'm helping someone else out. I'm, I'm, I'm treating my, my children or my parents or my spouse or my coworker with respect, and I've helped someone else out, and you've done it for all the right reasons, and then something that goes, wow, this is the way I'm supposed to be. You know what I'm talking about? Where everything rings true in you. There's no, no ulterior motive. It's like, wow, this is the way I should be. That's because you're designed that way. You're designed by God for God, and until you give yourself to God, you're going to hurt yourself and other people. And it's just the way it is. So today, we're going to talk about that. And the Apostle Paul understands it very, very well. In, a, in a, uh, another letter he wrote um, in Romans, a very famous, famous, famous passage of Scripture where he basically describes what you and I face nearly every single day. Romans 7. I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit to you, and then we'll get into our passage today. Romans 7.15 says the following. I don't understand myself at all. Okay, welcome to the club, right? For I really want to do what's right. But I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. I, don't need to be, I have that ice cream, Lord. You know, you know what I'm talking about? You know, we make a joke out of it, but how many of us know what? You don't want to do this thing. You, you want to be cool and calm and collective. You, you want to spend time with the Lord in, in, in prayer. You don't want to look at that. You don't want to do this or the other. And here you are doing it again. And you don't want to do it, but you want to do it. You know what I'm telling you? It's like, I don't want to do it, but man, I want to do it. And you struggle with this horrible it's a horrible fight. It's like there's a no-win situation. I, if I do it, I feel guilty. If I don't do it, I wish I did it. You know what I'm saying? If I do it, I feel guilty. If I don't do it, I wish I did it. So I'm like in this nebula of like, ah, it's never right. I, I can't win. Oh, it's frustrating. Let me just use the grace pill. I'll take a little grace pill, and I'll be good to go, and I'll do what I want. I'll put the grace jacket on. I'll be all right. You know, God understands. After all, I'm only human. And so it's very easy for us to get in that. And so the Apostle Paul talks about that. He goes on in the next verse in 18. He says, no matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. When I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyhow. And so I feel so bad, I'm going to watch online today. <laughs> and for those of you watching online, you should be here this morning. So that's very easy what can happen. Well, the Apostle Paul talks about kind of the same thing to a certain degree here in Galatians chapter 5, where we're dealing with this issue of grace and proper conduct. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read, actually read the whole chapter, okay? Yeah, we're going to read the whole chapter together. We're going to go through it together. Uh, it's important to read the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. We believe that here in this church. And so let's go ahead and look at it. Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 1. I'm going to go ahead and go through it with you. Okay, this is all about winning the civil war. And today, I guarantee you, the principles that are given to us in the scripture, principles matched with the relationship with God and his body will set anyone free, no matter what you're facing. I actually believe that. It's called the gospel. Here we go. Galatians chapter five, verse one. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. He says, stand fast. It's like fight, 
fight, and you're up here. You're not going to come. You're not going to cross this line. It's like a lineman on a football. You're not going to cross this line. I'm going to stop you. You have to stand fast. It's a militant. It's, it is an aggressive form. It's like, okay, all right. No, it's like, hey, I'm not going to mess around with you. I'm going to fight you. I'm fighting to take you down. I'm going for the kill here. I'm not going to let you through here. That's the kind of stand fast we're talking about here. Not this, okay, God understand. No, it's not about that. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. God has set us free. Stand in that liberty of freedom. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What bondage? Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Now, what on earth is he talking about? Circumcised? Let me explain Remember in the beginning of our time here today, I, I talked about the old ways of the Old Testament. And in order to be Jewish, you had to be circumcised. And we mentioned in the last three weeks, we mentioned that uh, if we did that in our church, there'd be no men in the church. There'd be all women, right? And, and it, was, it was a painful ordeal. And it was also, you had to do this law. You had to do this law. And Paul's saying, that's not what saves you. What saves you is a is a relationship with God. When we're surrendered to God and give our lives to God, that's what matters. These rules and regulations had a time and a period of time, the ceremonial types of laws, the moral laws don't really change, but the ceremonial and the civil, you see this, let me help you out here. There's civil law, which was basically what was taking place in the Jewish culture at that time, how to run their nation. There was ceremonial law, which is the way how they practice their, you know, you, how you cut the animal and how you do the incense. And then there was moral law. And the moral law didn't have really changed. That pretty holds today. But the ceremonial and the civil law, you know, those things have gone out with what was taking place. But the moral law has not changed. And so people were acting like, to be right with God, you got to do this list. And so it all came about what you could do. And so since I'm circumcised and you're not, I'm better than you because I can read my Bible and pray well in church because I can quote Scripture like it's going out of style and you can't, I'm better than you. Because I've been married 45 years, you've been married four days, I'm better than you. Because my kids behave and yours don't, I'm better than you. You see that? And so because I'm successful, I'm better than you. And so there there came this whole thing, if you're really a good Christian, you got to do what we're doing. And the Apostle Paul says, stop it. That's not what Christ has come. And if, if, if circumcision saves you, then okay, good. You want to follow the law and make yourself right with God? Go, 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 go for it. God's going to leave you, and you'll be all by yourself and doing the law. Because it's not the law that saves us. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross for us that saves us. And so there's this tension going on. And that's what he's talking about. And he says in verse 3, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged, have you? You have become estranged from Christ. You attempt to be justified by the law. What's that mean? You've been separated by Christ. You've been separated from Christ because you think you can do it without Jesus. You can't. Okay? I know this is an area that the church really struggles on, especially in our modern evangelical American culture today, which we're going to. We're going to really challenge today, and I, I, I pray, I tell you ahead of time, so don't be offended here, because you know what? I'm saying this, and the Bible says all this, because God loves us and wants the best for us, but a lot of the Christianity that we're embracing today, my friends, is not Christianity. It's self-help. It's good, it's good feel uh, evangelicalism, and a lot of it's true, but there's another part of it. We have to understand that with the good news, there's the bad news. I'm not here to condemn anybody. It's not about that. It's about Christ loves us. He's not come to condemn. He come to save. But if there was nothing to save us from, why do you have to save us? Jesus did not die on a cross so you could have a bigger house. Jesus did not die on a cross so your kids would behave in school. He did not die on a cross so you'd have a retirement plan. Now, God wants you happy. He wants his kids happy. But that's not why he came. He came to save us from eternal destruction, separation from him. That's a serious thing. And we'll get into that in a little bit. And he says, uh, verse uh, 4, verse 5, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait to the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. It's not about rules. It's about loving God. And because I love God, I'm doing the right thing. I cannot earn, I don't just, I'm not nice to my wife so I can 
uh, have her clean the house, take care of the kids. I love for my wife because I love her. And why I do nice things occasionally <laughs> is because, I'm just kidding, because I love her, right? I love my children. I, I, you don't have to tell me to love my, I love my children. I want to do nice things for them and bless them. And, and Why? Because I love them. I'm not doing rules. That's because of a relationship. And so it talks about that whole thing and says, verse 7, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, we're not bakers here today. Maybe some of you are. You put a little bit of leaven in a, in a, in a loaf of uh, in, in dough, apparently, from what I understand, because I don't cook worth anything except for eggs. Uh, it, it takes the whole loaf. A little bit of legalism, a little bit of sin will begin to despoil the whole thing. And I tell you, it really, really does. And so the Apostle Paul goes on and tries to explain this to the church, and by the way, to us today, Galatians 5, verse 10, I have confidence in you. Isn't that nice to know? He's confidence in them. I have confidence in you in the Lord. Let me stop there for a second. I have confidence in you in the Lord. Listen, God wants us to be confident people. We're not supposed to walk around, well, I'm just a Christian, I'm, just, I'm serving Jesus Christ, and I don't do this, I don't do that. And, you know, we go to church, we read the Bible, and you know, I don't want to do fine, I'm a Christian. No, you should be like this. I'm a Christian and I follow God. But not throwing your shoulders back in your own strength. But throwing your shoulders back because you're confident in Christ. You see, uh, sometimes, I, you know, I'm a pastor, as you know. And sometimes I go to pastor's meetings and often, I, I've shared you before, sometimes, you know, people are people, pastors are pastors, they're like you, they, you know, we, we all dress and eat and do all the same stuff you do. But they'll ask a question, and there's like a competition that, some, that can happen. How you doing? Hi, hey, what's your name? My name's Pastor. Well, hey, Eric, nice to meet you. How many are you running on Sunday? I mean, the first thing they'll ask you, how many are you running? What's your budget? How much are you giving? Well, on Easter Sunday we had, you know, I'm like, how many are you running? I said, I'm running them all. <laughs> it's so easy. All of a sudden you meet a guy, how, how big is your church? I'm 10,000. Oh, all of a sudden my view of this person went from here to here. I got to get to know him. Or I have a uh, church of 20. Okay. <laughs> And so we size each other up, and it happens in the corporate world as well. And then you start feeling not confident. But instead, we should throw our shoulders back and say, you know what, I'm confident in Christ Jesus. You see, we all desire to be confident. God, we're designed to be confident. But let me explain something to you. You're designed to be confident with Christ in the center of your life. You see, God made you for him. And when Christ is in the middle of you and you are adjusted to him in the proper manner, you can be confident, but not in a cocky, arrogant, you're just kind. I'm a child of God. I love God. And I'm not afraid of it. I throw my shoulders back. I'll be bold. I'll be strong. God loves me. I'm loved by him. And, and I'm confident in Christ, not in myself. The problem is we're confident in our position, in our education, in how we look or how we don't look. How much the needle on the scale goes back and forth. Well, you know, it's all that is, con no, that's not my confidence. My confidence is in Christ. Amen. So you don't have to try to put on charades and try to be somebody. I don't have to try to be, I am. You see the difference? And that's the way we should live our lives. And, and so the law becomes about all the stuff I can do and, and say, and it's not a good thing to do. And he goes on with that. So he says, in verse 10, I have confidence in you in the Lord. And I have confidence in Cornerstone Church in the Lord. I have zero confidence in Cornerstone Church without the Lord. Really, zero confidence in myself as well. But in the Lord, I have great confidence. That you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision or the rules and regulations... Why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased because the offense of the cross is that Jesus paid for it all for us. I could wish that those who trouble you even were cut themselves. He's used the word mutilation. Apostle Paul is not, he's not, so, okay, everybody. No, Apostle Paul's a tough guy. He doesn't play around. He says, you know what? They should be mutilated themselves. So that was some tough work. Well, where's the crazy Jesus there? We should be loving. I love you. You love me. We're such a jellyfish family. You know, with a great big hug and kiss to you and me. Jesus loves me. No one loves me. No, that's not what it's about. We can be confident and strong in the Lord. 
And so the Apostle Paul goes on in, in verse 10, uh, verse 13, excuse me, he says this, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use your liberty as an opportunity to the flesh. Now, we said, hey, I'm free of that. I'm not free of all those rules and regulations. Hey, we are under grace, man. It's all about grace. God understands. It's grace, bro. It's grace. And this is what we're hearing today. It's all about grace. God's grace. And it's true. His amazing grace is amazing. But look what the Apostle Paul says, and it talks to us today. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Not only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, which means the old way of doing things, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love the Lord. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you're saying, we're not all about, hey, man, I'm just, I, you know, I just love, I, I got grace. I can do what I want. It's not a license to do what you want. Well, God understands, you know, I'm a single young man. You know, I got, I have needs, I have greeds, and God understands, you know, I'm going to go out tonight, have a good time, and are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, true, I'm a Christian as I'm half drunk and flirting with the girls. Oh, that's not me, by the way. I'm just telling you this example, okay? And, and so, I, hey, God understands what's going on with that. Hey, it's all right, my friends. It's okay. You know, a little, little snort of cocaine never hurt anybody. It's, a, it's okay to, to be a little dishonest here because after all, we got to make a profit. I got to take care of the family. You know, I got to do this or the other. It's okay if I, you know, it's okay if I look and let my eye wander just a little bit. After all, there's nothing wrong with looking. And, you know, you got all these things we do. Hey, I like, I like the attention I get at the office. I dress to kill, and I make sure the guys look at me when they walk by. It's okay. God understands, you know. Hey, it's all grace, man. You know, don't be so, you guys are legalistic. And so we get to the other extreme. It's not like God wants us not to have fun. It's very simple. You know, when you buy something, you buy a new car, for example, you have the manufacturer's warranty. Okay, we, we bought a Kia. I know, I know. But it has a 100,000-mile warranty on it complete warranty. It's fantastic. So if anything goes wrong with the car, I can go, hey, it's broken here, so it's under warranty. But if I decide to throw a supercharger in my minivan, okay, nitrous oxide, put mag wheels and flames on it, and I blow the engine, I go like, the hey, <laughs> what's going on here, man? In the warranty. You got to take care of this van. Said, what are you talking about? You have a supercharger? You have a turbocharger? You have nitrous oxide and flames on the side of it with mag wheels and traction bars? And you want me to? No, you voided the warranty. Many of us void the warranty of grace. Hey, we know. It's not, you know, grace, I'll tell you what grace is. Being saved by grace means that you can totally abandon sin. Being saved by grace doesn't mean that we are now free to sin. It means that we are free not to sin. Okay? Grace is not freedom to sin. It's freedom not to sin. Now, listen, our society does an amazing job of passing the buck of responsibility. We're told today, to extreme cases, this is the way I'm born. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm born this way. I mean, they're even excusing criminals. Well, there's a criminal gene. So we really can't hold them responsible because that's in their DNA to be a criminal. I, I'm not making this up, folks. I'm not making this up. They're actually saying that now. Well, that's the way I was born, and that's my orientation, and then this is the way I am. I, I'm prone to these types of things. And, and everything is you're damned by your genetic code. That I'm stuck, i got to be this and the other. This is the way I am. And, and, and they tell you, hey, be free. Be free. Be in bondage to your own self. And they tell you, they promise you freedom, but the more freedom you have, the more in bondage you become. Why? Because you're not designed to live that way. God has, has designed us to be free in him. We're designed for him. So listen, in Garden of Eden, they were with God 100%. The moment they left God, they were now filling with other things, and it never works. It voids the manufacturer's warranty. You need Jesus in the middle of your life. That's the only way this thing really, really works. Talk about if, verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed with one another. I said then, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now we pivot to a whole other area. We went from legalism. Now we're dealing with, hey, man, I'm living in grace. Now it's like, wait a minute here. We're not given grace so we can live in, in more bondage. We're given grace so we can be free. 
And it goes on today, and he says uh, in verse 16, so I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I'm so glad it says walk in the Spirit. Because sometimes we think, if I come forward to the church and they lay hands on me, go, I'm saved now. I, I've been set free of all sin for the rest of my life. Now I have no more struggles. Well, I wish that was the case. I've seen people. I worked in a drug rehab uh, for a summer, and I, saw, I talked to a gentleman that was completely free of heroin, gave his life to Christ, no cold turkey, no symptoms. But he struggled for years with a spirit of lust. Okay, and so when we're not saying that you're set free and boom, no. What he's saying here is that walk in the spirit, you should not fulfill the lust. What does that mean? It's a walk. And a walk is one foot in front of the other. There's a great theological, theological treatise in the uh, puppet animation series called Santa Claus is Coming to Town, where Chris Kringle starts to sing a song that is so infectious, he's going to ruin the rest of your day. It's, put one foot in front of the other, and soon you'll be. Thank you. Put one foot in front of the other. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I have children, and I love these specials, okay? But anyhow, and what does he say? Put one foot in front of the other, and that's what we got to do. And every day, God wants to walk with you. It's not a leap. It's one step at a time. And what they teach you in these 12-step programs is you take one day, one step, and Christ will walk with you. He's not asking you to do this on your own. And we're going to share with you by the time we end today how we're going to do that. So, I'm sorry. I you're going to hear that song for the rest of the day. And we're going to have some mail. I'm like, Pastor, I went crazy with that song. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Verse 17. For the lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, they're contrary to one another so that you don't do the things you wish. Okay? There's a fight going on inside of you. Welcome to the club, everybody. You're not all by yourself. Bam! Okay? You don't want to do what you, you, you end up doing what you don't want to do. And it's frustrating. And he goes on to say in, in verse um, 18, but, he says, but if you are led by hard work and determination, no, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you see, it's impossible to live the Christian faith, it's impossible to live the Christian faith without God. It doesn't work. Without Christ, you can't live this thing. He says this, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law of rules and regulations. Now, he goes, the works of the flesh are evident. Well, let's go ahead through these. This is, a, this is quite a list, folks. And here it is. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery. And adultery means sleeping with someone else that's not your spouse. Fornication means sexual sin with someone who's not your wife. In other words, you're having sex and you're not married. That's not how God's designed it. He doesn't want to limit your fun. He wants to give you more fun. That's his design in marriage. And it, it, it brings destruction upon families. It messes things up. And God has made it for that reason, right? Uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry. What's idolatry? Idolatry is putting something before God. We're not designed to put something before God. It doesn't work, folks. You actually do damage to the product of your life. It voids the warranty. It only works when Christ is first because you're made for Christ and by Christ and to live with Christ. Sorcery. Giving into like tarot cards and seances and astrology and all that kind of nonsense, right? Hatred, that's quite clear. Contentions, where you always want to, every time you, you always want to argue with everyone. Jealousies, oh, you, no, okay. Jealousies, outburst of wrath. For example, you come home and you try to pull in the garage, you just waxed your car. You pull into the garage and there's a bicycle that's below the sensors. And it scratches your car. <laughs> then you open the door. And you walk in through to say hi to your wife. And you step on a Lego Batman. <laughs> Ow! Right? You see the kids. <laughs> ah! Right? You know, okay. I'm sorry. I'm just telling you where I am right now, okay? And the beautiful thing is, you know what, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I mess up like that sometimes, and I, I lose it, and this and the other, my wife's perfect, I'm not. You see what happens, you know what the, our, our family, you know what we do? We apologize to our kids. 
We do. We say, you know what? You were wrong not putting, you should put the bike away and all that. But the way we reacted was wrong. But what you did is wrong. We're still going to punish you. However, we're wrong. Please forgive us. And we're not perfect, and God forgive. And we, and we know we'll make it. We'll make up, and we're hugging each other all over again. And we don't let a day go by without selling issues. Some of you let things go on for weeks, years. Stop it, okay? Fess up, own it, take ownership of what you do wrong, and to get rid of it. Listen, you can't give something to Christ if you don't own it. Uh, what? Okay. If I give you my Bible, and it's not mine then how can you take it from me? It'd be stealing, right? But if I own my Bible and I give it to you, I'm giving, something that I, I'm giving something to you that I own. If you don't own your sin, you can't give it away. That's profound. You want to write that down. If you don't own your sin, you can't give it away. Stop making excuses for what you've done wrong. Own it. Yes, I screwed up. I was wrong <laughs> for those of you who know what I just did there you've been, you're showing your, your age with Fonzie okay you gotta say you're wrong you gotta own it so you can give it away how are you supposed to give your sin away if you don't own it you can't own it yes I made a mistake I was wrong I was wrong and Lord I give it to you you cannot give your sin away until you own it so, he goes on here. This wonderful list. Outburst of wrath, excuse me. <clears throat> Selfish ambitions where I want to be a leader at Cornerstone and outdo you. I have a bigger Bible study than you have or whatever, a small group. Dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, wild parties, right? Right? And the like, of which I, listen to this, folks. I know we're laughing here, but this is serious. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you time in the past, that those who practice, now practice doesn't mean you, you make a mistake once. Practice means like a doctor, he has a practice. That's why they mess up so much. No, I'm just kidding. I, doctor has a practice. It's something he does for a living or she does for a living, right? Uh, I tell you, those, let me read it to you here. Uh, just as I told you in the past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Whoa, whoa, hey, 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 man. We're under grace. Of course we'll inherit it. God understands. Well, I looked up the word inherit. You know what inherit means? It means to inherit. <laughs> <laughs> you inherit a fortune. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. If I don't have the kingdom of God, what does that mean? Does it mean I'm going to hell? Uh, do you want to play around with that? I, I frankly do not want to play around with that. Right? Pastor, you're talking illegal. No, I'm not talking. It's just the Bible says it. And if you don't believe me, look at Matthew 5.30. Before I say this verse, I want to let you know something. John 3.16, for God so loved the world he gave, right? John 3.17 says, I have not come to condemn, I've come to save. But Jesus didn't die on the cross, like I said, so you can have a better car, bigger house, better marriage, better hair, no facial hair. That's not why he came, all right? This is why he came, to save us. Save us from what? Destruction of sin and to establish a relationship with him. Now, look at this, what Jesus has to say. He's talking about what things can happen to you. He's talking to the church of his day. He's not talking to outsiders. He's not talking to... I don't know, I mean, the motorcycle gang, okay? He's not talking, he's talking to people inside the church of his day. Look what he has to say here. You can read it later on. It says this. I'm just summarizing uh, Matthew 5.30. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. Now, he says that in that passage there. He says it again in Mark. What is he saying? He's saying if you continue to practice sin and do not turn away from it, you're in danger of hell. Oh, that's legalism. I'm saved by grace. I can't lose my salvation. No, you can't lose it, but you can walk away from it. Pastor, that's, that's, that's wrong, pastor. We're saved by grace. Well, what did Jesus say? He, he says hell, folks. 
He's talking about hell. He doesn't want to send anyone to hell. But if you say, first of all, if that's your attitude, I don't even think you're even saved. Maybe you bought into the Christianity, you raised your hand on a Sunday or whenever, and it was like, you know what, I want a better marriage, I want to, I want to, I want to find someone to marry, I want a better job, I'm going to get rid of my depression, I'm going to get rid of my addictions, and so I'm going to raise my hand and give my life to Jesus, and as long as my life is better, I'll follow him. The moment it's not, it's not better, I'm gone. Well, my friends, you're not a Christian then. You're an admirer of the doctrine of, the, of Christianity, but you're not really his. I have good news for you. If you gave your life to Christ and you don't have it all together yet, that's okay. God's working with you. But if you say, I don't give a rip, I'm going to do what I want, you're not saved. You're just an admirer of Jesus. You're a fan. He's not your savior. I'm sorry to say. That's just the truth of the matter. So the stuff we keep hearing on, online and on, on, on television and radio, oh, I'm just give you a lot. No, my friend, there is a place called hell. There is a place called hell. I'm telling you, it's there. It exists. I don't even want to know what it's like. The Bible says it's like a fire. Burning never stops. My friend, Christ, Jesus didn't die on the cross so you could have a better hair day. He died on the cross because we're doomed without him. And he loves us so much that he gave himself. You think he would just put himself on the cross so you could have a better day? Please. Or you can discover the champion in you? Is that why he died on the cross? No, yes, he's a champion inside of you. But there's also a, something called hell. It isn't all about self-actualization. It's about God-actualization. I'm all for positive thinking. But you've got to deal with the real truth here. The Bible says it right here. Galatians 5, 22 to 26. This is the, this is the good news here, folks. I know we're going we're gonna to balance this off here. You're like, Pastor, I'm scared. Well, you shouldn't be scared, but you should have, you should have respect for God. Okay, we're not up here to say, you got to do this. and the, No, God loves you. If you're on the path to becoming more like him, your heart's in the right place. That's what he looks at. Your actions do count as well. But there's a grace that Christ died on the cross for you to help you through all this stuff. And we should be helping each other, not judging each other. You see the difference? Ah, you screwed up. <laughs> he screwed up. Oh, we feel so bad for you. Yeah, right. If you ever feel that, say, oh, I'm so glad. They're, oh, I knew their marriage wasn't perfect. Their kids were also, I'm so, oh, I feel so bad, man. They're going through a divorce. Ah, yes, yes, I knew my marriage was, that's not, that, that's condemnation. That's, but you should hurt when people sin. You shouldn't loathe and love it. So, Jesus is quite clear on that, folks. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is the good part. The fruit of the Spirit is what? We just talked about all the trash of the flesh. Not good, is it? Let's look at the fruit of the Spirit. You want to change all this other junk for this. Look at this. This is wonderful. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life is love. The greatest thing in all the world. Love. Joy. Who doesn't want joy? Who doesn't want peace? Sleep at night, nothing to worry about. This is the part I don't like. Long-suffering. Okay, let's, let's get rid of that fruit. I don't like that one. That means putting up with people that drive you crazy. <laughs> Kindness. Being kind to somebody. Hey, how you doing? Can I help you out? Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I thought about spirit control. Yes, but God is with you to help you control yourself. You're not damned by your DNA or your behavior. Yes, you may be an alcoholic, but your sin does not... Your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. That's where the 12 steps get it wrong, or 10 steps, whatever it is. Your Savior defines you, not your sin. Aren't you glad about that, folks? You don't have to measure up. He measured up. So now we join with Christ, and we walk with Christ. How do you walk with Christ? Well, we're going to tell you in a few moments. You keep teasing. I know. <laughs> Bible says, it says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit and not become conceited. Because when you walk in the Spirit, you have success. Don't think you're better than someone else. Provoking one another or envying one another. Now, I love what it says in Romans 8, 12 and 13. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. Isn't that good news? Well, that's just the way I am. No, it's not. 
That's the way you are. But God has something better for you, and you can do it. Greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. So you don't have to be bound to this thing. Yes, take ownership of, yes, I, I ownership, I'm an alcoholic. Yes, I take ownership of that. I, I'm full of pride, I'm full of lust. I take ownership. Take ownership and then give it to God. Stop making excuses. Well, he doesn't love me. She doesn't do it. Now, stop it. Own it. Take ownership. You can't get free until you take ownership because you can't give it away unless you own it. Boy, that's good. That's good preaching, folks. I hate to say it. <laughs> that's truth, my friends. It's not me. It's, it's the word of God in me, through me, working with God here in this whole thing, Okay. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, and by the way, it dictates things to you, you will what? What does that mean? Do I lose my salvation? Do you want to play around with that? But, but, I love the buts in Scripture. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds, plural, of your sinful nature, you will live. It's like owning a house. I had to power wash the, 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 the siding. It gets junk on it. You got to power wash your house with the Spirit of God. You power wash it with the water of the Word. Yes, you have a participation, but God is with you, working with you. Okay, imagine this. You're out there in the ocean. You're swimming. You're trying to body surf, and also you get caught in the undertow. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't swim anymore. Ah, ah. And all of a sudden, you're, 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 you're fearful, and a lifeguard comes out to you and swims next to you. He grabs you or she grabs you. Now you're swimming with the lifeguard into the beach. Some of us, what we have to do is say, God, I need help, God. And God will send his lifeguard out to with you and bring you from this sea of sin to the beach of grace. But you got to be able to grab on. I got this all by myself. No, you don't. How do you grab on to Christ? Well, we'll talk about that in a few moments once again. Trying to keep you, keep the line tight. Here's a couple of things I want to bring to your attention. You put up, this is very simple, okay? Very simple. Walking by the, walking by, um, <clears throat> walking by the spirit, not the flesh, okay? Here's a little, here's a statement. I don't know where I got it from, but I like it. What you feed leads. What you feed leads. What does that mean? Very simple. What you feed leads, <laughs> okay? If you feed junk, junk will rule you. If you feed bad things, bad things will rule you. It's like having two dogs. You might have heard this illustration. It's a great illustration. I can't find anything better, so I'm going to use it again, okay? You got two dogs. You got two Doberman pinchers, okay? One's, uh, one's pink and one's red, okay? And if you keep on feeding the pink one, the pink one's going to beat up the red one, okay? Then what you feed will lead, what you feed leads. That's simple. If you feed into those bad things, bad things are going to lead you. If you're looking at violence all day long, you're listening to sitcoms, you're listening to raw comedy where it's all about tearing people down and swearing, well, guess what's going to happen? If you spend eight hours a day listening to junk, guess what's going to lead your life? What's going to happen? I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I just can't overcome. Of course you can't overcome. You're starving God's law. You're, you're, star, you're, you're starving your spirit, man. You're feeding your flesh, man. Whatever you feed leads. You want to kill the flesh? Stop feeding the flesh. We're going to tell you how in a few moments how to do that once again to keep you. Here's another one. What entertains you trains you. What entertains you trains you. That's entertainment. Yeah, entertainment. We put our feet up. We're tired. You know how they, you know what they used to do uh, and, and the Soviet Union? and the, What they do is they make people tired and they, they put you in an interrogation room and not feed you, make you tired, and then they make suggestions to you. What happens at the end of the day? You're tired. You put your feet up. I want, and I want entertainment or I want to look at my iPad or my, or my Android or whatever it is, and I'm going to look at something and it's not the right thing. Your mind constantly be told, oh, I love these modern families. I love all this stuff on television. And they celebrate dysfunctionalism. And you're laughing at dysfunctionalism. It's funny. Yeah, I, I, you know what happened? I used to, I used to like a, a, professor, a program on television. I used to love it. I used to laugh. And all of a sudden, I, wait a minute, I'm laughing at the stuff that could kill me. And I realized that, you know, comedy can be the uh, candy of arsenic. It's the Novocaine that makes it easier to sin. You're not careful. 
Is it godly? Is it true? Is it noble? So not about legalism. You can't go to the movies. No, we're talking about that. We're talking about, wait, is this, is this godly? What entertains you, trains you? Do I want to be trained by murder? Do I want to be trained by adultery? Do I want to be trained by mocking someone like some of our political candidates do? No. We don't want to do that. You know what the Bible says? Bad company corrupts good morals. Let me tell you something else. You don't realize this, but it's true. We are, we are people that live in community. Make no mistake, your environment has an effect upon you, whether you like it or not. It's called secondhand sin. I used to go see a, a, a band in the 80s, a, a Christian band, and they only played in clubs, okay? So I used to just go to the clubs and see Striper, okay? Anyhow, <laughs> I used to like them. Anyhow, uh, but I used to go see them, right? I used to be in clubs, and I had my leather jacket on and the whole thing, and I had the bullet, the boots, the whole thing. I was, you know. I'm in there, and I'm a Christian, but everyone's smoking in there, right? I get out, and my mother goes, were you smoking? No, I wasn't smoking. I was... But the secondhand smoke got on me. Well, you know, secondhand sin gets on you. You may not be participating in it, but you've got to wash yourself of it. The only way I get rid of that smoke smell, I had to take a shower and lather up. So every day, my friends, we've got to get into the word of the Lord and change your company. Your company affects you. Make no mistakes. The Bible says it. Bad company corrupts good morals. It's that clear. It's true. Your environment affects you. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. If you know your environment affects you, it will help you to stop it from affecting you. Let me just tell you right now. I'm going to tell it again. Your environment affects you. Who you hang out with, who you hang out with hangs on you. That's another good one. I don't know where I got that one from. I got it during the service. Who you hang out with hangs on you. Who you hang out with hangs on you. Birds of a feather flock together. That's not mine. Okay. Okay, I'm telling you the truth, folks. We are people of community. If you understand the danger of association, listen, when a, when a surgeon goes in to operate on somebody, what does a surgeon do? They wash their hands first and arms off the ear. They scrub it for over a minute. Then they put the gloves on, the gowns on, the mask on, the glasses on, and then they go in to operate on someone. Why? Well, number one, they don't want to get them infected. And number two, they don't want to be infected. That's legalism. I can do what I want. Jesus, save me. Let me go in there and operate and someone without washing my hands. You get someone else sick and you'll be sick. That's legal. No, it's, it's called wisdom, right? And so God tells us these things not to destroy us, but to help us. But it's not the gloves, it's not the soap, it's not the surgical mask that saves somebody. It's a relationship with the doctor that saves somebody. You see the difference, folks? These things are to aid us and help us. They don't save us. Is that clear? I hope we get that clear. Okay? The Bible says, be in the world, but not of the world. Be in the world, but not of the world. You're going to be like mammals, like a whale or a dolphin. You know what the dolphins do? They go up. They break the top of the water. They enter a new world called the atmosphere, and they breathe in the atmosphere. Then they go back down and swim for 25 minutes. They're in the sea, but not of the sea. While fish, they, <laughs> okay, and they just take it in, and whatever the temperature of the waters, they are. And stop being slimy fish, and start, start being killer whales. All right, folks, listen. The whales have their own temperature inside of them. They breathe of a different planet. You and I, every day, she go, I need to go up and get a breath. You need to go up and pray, take a big uh, big, a big breath of heaven's air, and go back down in the world again, and realize you're not supposed to be a slimy fish. I don't like fish anyhow. <laughs> Never that has steak. I'm sorry if I defended you with that. Get over it. <laughs> Be in the world, but not of the world. And listen, you know, it's very important who you hang out with. I'm going to ask the worship team to get ready. Very important who you hang out with. You know what happened to, in, in Joshua, in, in uh, Exodus, for example, they sent out the 12 spies. Moses said, okay, uh, let's check out the land. He thought it was a good idea. It was not a good idea. Sent out 10 people. 12 people, two came back and said, we got this. God is with us. God with us, we can overcome. The 10 come back says, we're like little grasshoppers. And they take God out of the equation and they're overwhelmed. Maybe some of you are overwhelmed by what you're facing. And what happened? The fear of the big crowd got on the whole nation and they missed an opportunity to enter God's promises because they believed in what they could do instead of what they could do with God. 
If you want to live in this nebula of, oh, yeah, I'm, just, I'm a product of my environment. I can't help myself. That's my DNA. That's my orientation. No, it's, yeah, I'm oriented to sin. Oh, I can't help myself. I'm going to steal. I can't help myself. How can you come to work today? Well, uh, you know, I, I like to sleep. <laughs> I like to sleep, man. Uh, they didn't understand. I can't help it. It's my orientation. I like to sleep. Come on, folks, right? Stop being fish. Let's be killer whales for the kingdom of heaven. You know what it says in the Psalm 133? It's just what it says. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commanded the blessings of life evermore. How do we overcome? By being in unity together. And we're going to look about here in a few moments. And then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Stop being damned by society. Stop being damned by a diagnosis of a doctor or what someone has said to you. You are no obligation to the things of the, of the flesh. How do I get free? Real, real simple. It's so simple, it's, it's almost insulting. Number one, you need to give your life to Christ. Some of you have not given your life to Christ. You've given your, you've given your life to Christianity, the culture but you have not given to Christianity the Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, he's here for you. The reason why you're alive is his grace to follow him. You need to connect to God, giving your life to Christ. And And for all of us, you need to connect to God daily. Daily. It's a walk, friends, one foot in front of the other, and soon you'll be walking out the other door. Okay, you have to put one foot in front of the other daily. And let me tell you, you have to... Get out of the sea of the world and break into the different atmosphere and take time to breathe in heaven. Now, how do you do that? I want to encourage you. I, I can't stand on this whole thing. I tell you right now, if I don't read my Bible every day and spend time with God, I start slipping. I do. And so will you. Connect to God in a concentrated way every day. Well, I, I pray with God throughout the day. That's fine. But at least take five, ten minutes, whatever, and just you and God and say, God, I give you this day. Father, I give you my life today. This life is not mine, it's yours. Take a moment to pray and then open the Bible and wash yourself. Take a shower in the Word of God. Get a Bible you understand. Read through the New Testament and and underline what you see and pray it through. And then keep God throughout the day. And then it's time to break negative associations. You got some friends that you don't need to hang out with anymore. You need to say, I'm busy. What happened? I'm busy. Can you, how about tomorrow? No, I'm busy for the rest of my life. I'm sorry. I don't have time for you anymore. Well, aren't we supposed to save the loss? Not if the, the loss pull you down. Break off associations with negative people that will pull even negative Christians. Don't hang out with people who say, I can't. Hang out with people who say, I can through Christ. Listen. Divorce is a communicable disease. Jimmy Evans says it. He's absolutely correct. If you're going through a bad marriage, don't hang out with people that are in their fifth marriage. Well, I get together with my friend, her husband, and his... No, hang out with someone that's been married 45 years. Hang out with Dave and Edith Young have been married over 55 years. Hang out with people that are, that marriage is working. Why would you want to go to someone who isn't working? Now, God bless that person, but you're not the person you need to go with, right? Who you hang out with affects you. This is why it's so important to connect to God. And this is why we, we, we listen, we're not about small groups. Or how big is our small group ministry? Now, it's not about a ministry. It's about getting us connected to other believers. We're not called to do this by ourselves. We're called to work in community. That's how it works, folks. We're made for community. God has made us for that reason. To work together. The body of Christ working together can overcome any obstacle. Any obstacle. Don't believe what the doctor... No. Own it and give it to God. We might have some struggles. I don't understand why God isn't delivered of every single thing. But you know what? I believe he can. I'm going to follow him. Even if I die, believing he can. Daily washing of the word. Keeping throughout the day. Break off negative friends. Listen. Come to church weekly. You know what the Bible says? Okay, here's a nice sobering thought to leave you through the day. All right, here we go. Hebrews 10, 23. You're going to love this one. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope 
without wavering. Hold on to Christ in our confession. For he promises faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, right? Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as in the manner of some, or some has made a habit of, but exhorting one another so much even more as you see the day coming. He says, hey, don't deny fellowship with the body of Christ. Get in the church with other believers and encourage each other and admonish each other. Yes, even correct out of love. Not out of, oh, I'm glad they screwed up. No, I care about you, my friend. Now, this part, no one, wants to, no one likes to quote this part, so they just, that's all you ever hear. Well, let's read the rest of the verse. Verse 26. For if we sin willfully. I'm not saying you make a mistake. I'm saying I know it's wrong and I don't care. I got God's grace. I take the grace pill and I can have my thrill. And you take that grace pill, you want your thrill? Look what it says here. But if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. <gasps> Is that hell? Do you want to play around with that? If, if that's your attitude, I don't think you're even saved. Because it, it, it's like, am I thinking, how can I cheat on my wife and still be married? Is that, what, is, that, is that a marriage? No. I would never dream of doing that. But I want to be pure and holy to my wife because I love my wife, I love my family, I love God, right? So we're not talking about being perfect. We're talking about having the right thing. My friends, listen, there's a place called hell. It's real. And there was a Savior who died on the cross to save us from hell and have a relationship. And yes, we can have our best life now. Absolutely, we can with Christ. But there's a worse life now as well and a worse life forever if we're not careful. Okay? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you, Lord. I know this has been a, a, a very sobering word today, Lord. I recognize the fact, God, that the enemy would try to, to twist my words and twist the Bible to make us feel like we're in condemnation. We thank you. It says so clearly in your scripture, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, but fearful judgment for those that aren't. And Lord, we recognize that today in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, I'd like to give you an opportunity. If you've never given your life to Christ, Maybe you've come to church. Maybe you like Christianity. You're like, yeah, it's fun. I like the music. I like the, you know, I get an inspirational word here and there. But you've never completely sold out to God. You never gave him the deed of your life. Today can be your day. He's come to save you from hell and to give you a best life now and forevermore. But you have to be willing to give your life to him. You don't have to get it together first. He'll take you just the way you are because he loves you. You don't expect the baby to be perfect. You just come and God will grow you. Yes, you'll make mistakes. I make mistakes every day, but come into his grace. If you'd like to give your life to Christ, I'm going to ask you to bow your head. I'm going to pray a prayer today, and if you will pray this prayer with your heart and confess with your mouth, then you can today can start a saved relationship with Christ Jesus, and you can be confident that to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. If you want to say this prayer with me quietly in your own heart, I'm going to pray right now. You want to follow with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I willingly take ownership of my sin. I take my sin, I take ownership, and I give you my sin. Take my sin from me. Thank you that what you did on the cross pays for every sin I've ever done. I thank you now that I am clean and, and, and clear. I give you my ownership of my life. I declare I'm not my own, I'm on yours. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed. Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. See, quick show of hands. Come on, listen up. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Come on. Let's be honest here this morning. Anyone at home watching later on? Come on. This is a holy moment, folks. I'm going to ask you to do something. There's a card in your, in your bulletin, uh, and it says here, I accepted Christ today for the first time or recommitted my life. Can you just do that? Take ownership of it. We want to help you through this process, folks. We're all in this together, folks. We're all in this together. No one's perfect, but God's perfect. I want to pray for the rest of you right now, okay? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we recognize, Father, that you have good plans for us. We want to walk in the spirit and not the flesh. Father, I pray you connect us to yourself. Connect us to small groups, Father, that we'd be connected to each other. And Father, we thank you that the best days are ahead for those who love you. And Lord, we choose to follow you today in Jesus' name. I pray for breaking off of all kinds of sin 
in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for breaking up of, of addictions to pornography, addictions to wine, to drugs, to prescription pills. Father, addictions to money, addictions to gambling, addictions to flirting, materialism, addiction to guilt. <laughs> and Lord, we embrace you. We declare that I can do all things through Christ. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand up if we could, please. As you leave here today, if you could put this card in one of the boxes, we will get back to you. I want to invite you. The class is starting here in 30 seconds from now. But I just really didn't need to unload this message today. I just had to do it. And so that's why I, went, I, I can do that. I'm the pastor of the church. <laughs> so it's important, okay? Sometimes we can break the schedule. So God bless you. We ask their prayer team to make their way down. If you need prayer, otherwise we dismiss you as we sing one last song. God bless you guys. grace, power of the Spirit, and the fellowship of God be with you all today. Let's be victors in Christ. Amen, everybody? God bless you.